This program is designed to provide general information with regards to the subject matters covered. This information is given with the understanding that neither the hosts, guests, sponsors, or station are engaged in rendering any specific and personal, medical, financial, legal, counseling, professional service, or any advice. You should seek the services of competent professionals before applying or trying any suggested ideas. Good morning, true seekers and true crime junkies. This is Nanette Bartow. Um, I am back with Hit the Road Jack, Finding the Zodiac. Um, this week, we are actually traveling back to uh, the mur- one of the murders that we left off with before um, Sherry Jo Bates, just to kind of uh, touch bases where we were. And I want to make sure that this murder stays kind of in the top of everyone's mind, um, just because I think that it plays into additional um uh, murders, murders that occurred during this time frame. So um, I'm going to go ahead and take us back to uh, the presentation at this point. Perfect. So basically, this just before Sherry Jo Bates last week, we were talking about this murder that occurred in uh, Tiburon, California, um, off of Paradise Drive in Belvedere. The um, I'm not sure that the person has ever been identified at this point, listed just as a woman or probably a Jane Doe. Um, It was in the Bolingas Lagoon. She was wearing a red dress and it was on Paradise Drive. And all of these items that I just mentioned are going to be something that you're going to be able to um, match up to further information as we make it through this presentation. Um, So I went into... uh, setting some foundation for Sherry Jo Bates murder. And one of the ways that I thought I could do that was to read you one of the Zodiac letters that was mailed to the LA times. And it says, this is the Zodiac speaking. Like I've always said, I am crack proof. Now, mind you, a lot of these words that I've underlined here are going to be key words that we're going to be seeing. So he says, if the blue meanies are ever going to catch me, they had better get off of their fat asses and do something. Because the longer they fiddle fiddle and fart around, the more slaves I will collect for my afterlife. I do have to give them credit for stumbling across my Riverside activity. That's what's going to take us into Sherry Jo Bates. He says, but they are only finding the easy ones. There are a hell of a lot more down there. Now, in the Zodiac communications, he made sure to tell you in the beginning who it was that he had killed uh, before he had decided he was no longer going to make that public. Um, He knew that, well, he still stated he was going to commit murders by different MOs, but they would also look like fake accidents and otherwise, and they wouldn't know which to attribute to him. But he also would make time to write when someone else had committed a crime he didn't want pinned on him and let them know that he wasn't responsible for it. So when he does take credit for something, I take that extremely serious because he does not want credit for something he hasn't done. So he wouldn't just arbitrarily take credit for murders or other crimes that um, he wasn't responsible for. And I wanted to key in really on a hell of a lot more. So not just more, as we've been seeing in the communications, there will be more or more to come, a hell of a lot more. So not even just a lot more, but a hell of a lot more. This tells me that we have many bodies that we're looking for um, down in that particular area. And obviously Riverside is still in the uh, Southern California area. So when he says down there, he's not specifically stating just in Riverside, I'm sure. And we're going to talk about some of those other cases that have likely connected themselves to this. He says, the reason that I'm wanting writing, so the Times is, they can't bury me on the back pages like some of the others. I thought that was interesting because I wondered if um, that wasn't a message to maybe someone stating that you're not going to be able to bury me or take me out or kill me. Um, I thought that was kind of a hidden message, but in the back pages, like some of the others, uh, we know that he was never on the back page of most anything. And the fact that he sent this letter to the LA times, 
Um, he sent it first off airmail, which is something you would do if you were sending out of country to another country, not necessarily inside the United States from California or from Northern California to Southern California, but he still marked it airmail. And then the fact that he actually mailed it to the Los Angeles Times, we know that this is the uh, stomping grounds and the killing area for Bauerdorf and Black Dahlia, the lone wolf woman uh, murders, the uh, Magnolia murders. There were several sets of, well, the media just kept giving them different names to sensationalize things so they can make money. But the bottom line is, is we have the Zodiac Killer writing to the LA Times, which is the Black Dahlia area, talking about his Riverside activity, which is Sherry Jo Bates. So we're going to um, take this letter for what it's worth, and that indicates that we are looking for crimes that are at least in the Southern California area, and we're going to talk about some of those as we make it through the presentation of Sherry Jo Bates. Um, <clears throat> My research this last week on Sherry Jo Bates has kind of um, thrown up some red flags. You're going to have to be really careful when you get on the internet and you start researching these cases. If you come across a website that says that she drove a yellow Volkswagen bug, get off of it. They've cut and pasted from somebody else's stuff and they literally have the information wrong and have not done their re research in order to uh, dispel the fact that her VW was was yellow. And we'll talk about that in a few minutes. But um, I also did some research in the uh, FBI Freedom of Information Act, I call the FOIA files. Um, and one of those produced an actual document from the FBI. And it stated that Mr. Sherwood Morrill concluded that the three envelopes and letters, along with the printed poem on the desk, had been prepared by the same person responsible for the Zodiac letters. Now, Sherwood Morrill is one of the top Department of Justice document examiners at that particular time. Him and Terrence Pascal, which I will speak about Pascal later on in the Zodiac case, but he and Terrence Pascal were the two main uh, document examiners that uh, did the examinations on the writings from the Zodiac Killer of the Riverside area. So um, one other thing that I kind of stumbled across this last week was a documentary. It was about 42 minutes long. You can find it on Netflix. It was extremely interesting. If you want to see the likes of what I'm talking about and the political strife and the lack of transparency and the things that we had going on in our government pretty much this entire time. And it was called the Martha Mitchell effect. Uh, very interesting that they dubbed it this, but basically Nixon's advisor um, was married to Martha Mitchell, and she was a very truthful, outspoken person. She said just what was on her mind. She had no problem doing it in front of the press, to the news, to everything. So, of course, when this Watergate thing hits, um, she is compelled to, to uh, defend her husband by stating that he had no part or participation in this particular case. But then um, as she started to speak, up and blame Nixon and other people within the um, party. Uh, they began to, to make her look like she was crazy or she's a, a drunk or she's on medications. Either way, they did everything to character assassinate her in the media, with the press, with everybody around her. Uh, even having her husband step down because she was purportedly ill. Um, but you can actually see recorded sessions in which they're talking about this woman and doing whatever they can without killing her to shut her up or at least cause the rest of the world to think she's crazy. So now that has brought me to the Martha Mitchell effect and the Zodiac case, because that's exactly what I find. When somebody has some truth, when somebody can discount the information that they're putting out there, like Tom Voigt and these other websites, sites that are not trying to find the true killers. Um, they're literally just disseminating the information, flooding the market with so much stuff that a person couldn't possibly begin to take the time to sit down, figure it out, sort out the crap, and then use what was really good there to attempt to investigate these cases. And that has happened to Sandy Betts, to Harriet Suchet, to myself, to Dennis Kaufman. Um, they seem to have this ad hominem argument where they don't necessarily want to address the evidence or tell us why the evidence doesn't fit. They just want to tell us that we're full of it or we're smoke and mirrors. I don't know. I've heard pretty much all of it. So just to kind of recap as well, we have this, we have Letha, Jack's first wife, 
um, in December 22nd of 1964. She is uh, filing for divorce, citing extreme cruelty, which this may kind of help to explain some of the Christmas murders. This is a trigger. But Jack has ran off to Texas in 1963 with Doris on his heels, and Letha finds out about this, and of course she wants a divorce. And on February 5th of 1965, we see that that interlocutory degree of divorce is complete, and they are divorced, and then that's when we see Jack heading back to California to try and find Doris who's left him back in Texas. So small recap there. Um, this is one of those ad hominem arguments. I, I rarely can get to these, these uh, messages. So I, I have people who leave a message on these um, videos that I'm producing on YouTube, but then I have a heck of a time getting myself around to them. I was actually able to find one I did not know it existed. It had been posted something like four months ago. Um, and I saw the, the particular statement was just absolute garbage, period. Period. First thing in my head, I rung true. Tom Voigt. Oh my gosh, this sounds like him. So I clicked on this link, Zodiac Killer Official, which this is the little avatar that's up here in the corner that left the message. And when I clicked on that link, I found that lo and behold, it went right down to presented by Tom Voigt and the Zodiac Killer.com. No questions there. I knew exactly where these messages were coming from and the camp that they were coming from. So rather than actually explaining why the information in Dennis Kaufman's um, Zodiac, the real story documentary is untrue or telling us how Jack can't be the person, they write simple statements like absolute garbage or we're crazy or we're this or we're that. March Martha Mitchell effect. That's what I'm going to call from now on the Voight camp. So I also wanted to show you guys what, what occurs in the media. So uh, I want to say in 2020, at some point when everybody is locked up due to COVID, we see that there's a press release. 40-some 40, 40 detectives have claimed that they have solved the uh Zodiac killer case, release a uh, do a press conference and do a release on CBS News saying that the case is closed. Now, I, I can't even imagine why CBS, without even um, vetting this, would have allowed them to come on and say that the case is closed, other than the fact is that this goes out big time. Every time something like this happens and a press release is done, it goes out to the masses. So almost everybody gets to see it on every news channel. And then we get to see a follow-up like we did with the anthem case where a week later in the Congress came in and said, no, you can't close the case. We'll talk about that later too. Um, but we see down here, the top, the top one up here says unsolved Zodiac killer case closed CBS news. And then we get this tiny little two second retort from the FBI that says FBI shuts down claims Zodiac killer has been identified. So of course the FBI is now coming back out and saying they didn't. So the FBI says the Zodiac killer case has yet to be solved, shutting down claims the identity of the killer has been resolved. A group of around 40 investigators dubbed the case breakers published a press release claiming they had identified the Zodiac killer as Francis G P or Gary Francis Post, a man who died in 2018. However, that information was not evidently good enough to close the case and the FBI had to come out and shut them down. But nobody got to see this. I didn't even get to see this. I got to hear from my friends telling me, oh, did you hear, Nanette? They say they've solved the case again. All right. Well, I did a little bit of research. Not only does Gary Post not wear glasses, I, I viewed pictures of him from, I want to say, somewhere in the 1960s all the way up to 2008. The man never wore glasses. Um, he is not the person that we're looking for. Either way, I just find it interesting that these individuals are capable of getting this out into the news, confusing the public, and then the, the tiny little shutdown that the FBI does never gets heard, never gets seen, and nobody knows the difference. So if another pe person comes to me and says, now Gary Post is the person, they said it, yes, they said it, it was on the news, believe a little of what you hear there as well. <clears throat> So I began looking in the FOIA files for Sherry Jo Bates. One of the things that I want everybody to notice is that when I went into the FBI vault and typed in Sherry Jo Bates' name, I found that there were no, no uh, results found, which was kind of boggling because we just looked at a document that came from the FOIA file. So where is this file? 
Then I decided I'm going to go ahead and use different versions. I tried using Riverside Phantom Killer, Red Phantom Killer, like anything that maybe the media might have dubbed and maybe they used as a case file name, like D.B. Cooper, as we see down here. So we know that D.B. Cooper was not the person who hijacked the plane, that Dan Cooper was the um, alias that was used. But D.B. Cooper was something they came up with because there was somebody listed in that local area with the name D.B. Cooper. So the case got dubbed D.B. Cooper, even though that's not who actually stole the money. Um, either way, I looked it up in that in that direction, could not find anything underneath the surnames of the serial killer. And then I went ahead and I just put in the word Bates. When I put in the word Bates, I came up with a whole list, 700 and I want to say 14 or 40 um, different files that con that contain the word Bates in it for one reason or another. And for the purpose of my research, I obviously did not want to go through these because the, the one file I chose to go through was 239 pages. That's a lot of reading that I had to do on top of other research tasks this last week. And so if you can imagine, there's 239 pages in this particular file right here which was the Zodiac Killer Part 5 of 6. That's the one that I went to. And in doing so, I was actually able to find additional documents in regards to the Bates crime. Why she doesn't have her own file, I'm still completely unclear of. But when I noticed that that there were files in regards to Bates in the Zodiac Killer, I also took notice to the rest of the files that were surrounding it. And I was finding things like Watergate, D.B. Cooper, um, Pro. If you don't know what Pro is, that was a government program of wiretapping, I believe, um, illegal wiretapping um, into, I believe, the group for Martin Luther King because they assumed that they were somehow trying to, um, I, I really don't understand why they were listening in on them, but they were. Either way, I found it extremely interesting that these are the type of cases that are coming up when I run Bates. What's the connection here? Now, I certainly don't have the time to go through all of these files. It's thousands and thousands and thousands of pages. Um, to be able to determine each and every single single um, document that might be in there in regards to Bates, though it might be a task I take on at some point. Either way, um, likely research into these other cases would prove up some type of document or some type of a connection. So uh, another, another screenshot I took of another few files included Hillary Clinton, Meyer Lansky, um, the attempted assassination of President Ronald Reagan, the Hells Angels, Spiro Agnew. There is actually some solves that Harriet has come up with that indicates that Spiro Agnew was supposedly being told on in some of these communications. Um, Al Capone, J. Edgar Hoover, like all of the players that we've talked about up to this point are pretty much in these files that are somehow connected. <clears throat> I also found on Joseph Bonanno, um, Robert F. Kennedy, again, D.B. Cooper. He kept coming up a few times. Um, and that, of course, led me to Sherry Jo Bates, which we started and now we're going to get in pretty heavily. I have a lot of great information here for you guys. On October 30th of 1966, Sherry Jo Bates at River City College, 4800 Magnolia Avenue, Riverside, California. Um, again, I might want to add that this address may have a tie into the Red Hibiscus murders or the Magnolia murders murders that were in um, Los Angeles and, and a previous, the red hibiscus murders that were previously in Riverside, though I haven't done any research on those particular ones. Um, we're also remembering that Jack has come back in by his own admission, September of 1966, uh, to find Doris because she has sold all of his belongings while he was in Texas and moved back to California. So Jack is now on her heels trying to find her and he is back in California. California at his brother's house in Riverside, California, which sets us up for this next murder. Um, in the picture here, we can see this is the entrance to the library at RCC College, or at least at that particular point in time. Sherry Jo Bates was said uh, had left a note for her father that she was going to the library and that she would be back later. And some of the some of the pictures that were actually linked, this was the alleyway in which Miss Bates was actually killed. You can see um, the body that is present here to the right hand side of the road. And we're going to talk about that because um, there was purportedly an eyewitness who came down this alleyway from the library at 930 at night, but indicated that they had not seen anybody or a body. Um, but when we talk about this area, we're going to see exactly um, why the, there's a possibility they were able to walk right past this body in the event that it 
that she was killed at an earlier time frame. Um, and then, of course, we see them actually covering up the body and, and getting ready to um, start investigating the murder. Down here in the left-hand corner, we see that there's the great big huge Los Angeles Times Zodiac linked to Riverside Slain. Now, as far as we know, the media is as sensational as it could be. I'm not going to hang my hat on the fact that the LA Times said this. I'm going to give you other information and evidence that's going to support uh, the link from the Zodiac to Sherry Jo Bates. So first off, I want to um, dispel the notion that is being seen on the internet. I read in a lot of places uh, she was nearly decapitated. She wasn't nearly decapitated. People don't know what they're talking about. Um, some websites were calling out others saying, you're stupid. She wasn't decapitated. I found the, the um, death certificate for Sherry Jo Bates, and it shows that she hemorrhaged due to laceration of the right car. car carotid artery, um, multiple stab and slashing wounds of the abdomen and neck, uh, inflicted with a sharp, oh, can't even read that word. Some of these things are just so, so blurred out. Anyways, um, the article shows, or the uh, evidence shows that she was stabbed numerous times in the lungs, arms, a laceration of the right carotid artery, throat cut almost to decapitation and face, using a small knife approximately three and a half inches long by a half inch width. Now, that size knife was used in the Ardsma and the Springer uh, murders, so we are going to continue to in, uh, look at that size knife as we go through Sherry Jo Bates. So I also found a document from the city of Riverside, which indicates that um, there was a phone call after the murder of Sherry Jo Bates to the police department. This is Zodiac 101. In the Lake Berryessa murders, he did it. In the Lake Herman Road murders, he did it. In the Paul Stein case, he did it. Um, he, this man not only writes communications, but attempts to verbally communicate his deeds. Um, so I thought it was extremely interesting to note because that was something I hadn't heard before that there was actually a phone call made. Now, some of the other coincidences at this point was that the heel prints identical to dress shoes worn by Air Force personnel. So um, the heel print that was made was, yes, tied back to a military installation, but it was also tied to a prison. So Leavenworth was actually making these shoes, I believe, and dispersing them either in a dress shoe or a boot style pattern. So the dress shoes and the boots were also manufactured for the military. Um, I did want to note also that Doris, that Jack is currently chasing at this point in time, her father worked for the penitentiary system. I believe he was either in the commission or he was very high up um, while he lived in Colorado. Also, the Lake Berryessa suspect stated he had just escaped from a prison in Montana and going to Mexico, which is consistently men mentioned by the suspect in my communications. Another thing that occurred was that Kathleen Johns, during this research, I found that she had stated that the um, suspect wore extremely shiny shoes, spit shiny. I'm, I'm not sure what, what word they actually used for it, but it was um, to the effect of dress shoes, basically. So if, in fact, we're looking at an either boot or dress shoe made for the military or personnel, then we are likely finding that on Jack. The phone call to the police department after the murder, again, that's Zodiac 101 and many of the other crimes, actually. There were phone calls in the lipstick killing case that I'm sure if we were given access to the Texarkana case, we're going to find some of the same things that have never been published, produced, or put onto the internet. Um, to follow that up, the suspect in this case wrote three handwritten letters and envelopes and then typed up a confession letter that was um, done on carbon paper through a teletype, which is a machine that the uh, military used back in that day. So we have another military uh, connection. I also found a cursive envelope. The contents of it at, at the point when I started this, I was not was not known to me. But now I'm starting to believe that it's possible that it's the Patricia Houts letter. And it would make sense because that particular envelope is done in an artistically female style cursive writing. And I'll show you that so you know what I mean. So a little bit of background on Sherry Joe Father's or Sherry Joe's father, which Joseph Bates was employed at the Corona 
California Naval Ordnance Laboratory and lived at 4195 Via San Jose in Riverside, California. Joseph's work was actually related to very highly guarded missile development under the head of Dr. Huntoon. And I did find a lot of information in regards to him in this particular establish, uh, establishment. Uh, but this is obviously for the Navy. And again, we're back at the Navy where Jack was. Also, in this particular document, we will find that the um, let's see the Riverside Police Department was sending this document to a share to the sheriff of Napa County. In which case, he notes in here that um, she was also stabbed once in the back, and her throat was severely cut, almost to the extent where she was decapitated. So let's put it to rest now where everybody is trying to say she wasn't almost decapitated. This is very much like the bisection type process that occurred with Black Dahlia and the lipstick killings. Not to say necessarily that it was as nice because he's using a much smaller knife, I'm sure, than what he had access to in those other murders. But the fact that he attempted to actually bisect her and leave her on public display was identical to Black Dahlia. So there's another consistency. I did find also another document from a Sheriff Earl Randall and some of the points that I wanted to point out here is that he says the person who wrote the confession letter is aware of facts about the homicide that only the killer would know. There is no doubt that the person who wrote the confession letter is our homicide suspect. And I'm going to say that the only thing that I could find inside of there that wasn't public knowledge was the fact that the knife broke. So we're going to be talking about that through this conversation um, and that there is other evidence that is tying these together that they were not at liberty to tell us. And I think that I also discovered that that is possibly the Zodiac taking an item from a previous crime and placing it at the new crime scene in, in an attempt to um, tie those crimes together. And we're going to see as we work through it whether or not that's something that's provable or something that's just kind of la-la out in the air. Either way, I also um, found a newspaper article that was kind of similar to what they set up there. And it says, while it cannot yet be said with certainty, it is considered quite probable the, the library poet known to be Zodiac, also authored the confession letter. They are considered authentic They are considered authentic because they revealed facts about the slain only the killer could have known. So I always come back to this. We're going to see many instances where people who are not the actual killer have information, at least enough to get people to pay attention to them, um, whether it's law enforcement or otherwise, and then only to find out that, inf that information that they had. Nobody can explain how they had it, but they were not found to be the killer. Um, and that, tell, that tells me that there was a possibility in some cases that Jack was just the letter writer and maybe not the perpetrator, though he was very much a killer and we do have him killing several people. He is part of all of this. So another thing that I notated in this particular document is that the original of this letter was evidently destroyed or kept by the sub suspect. So the original wasn't turned in. As the press and our department received a co copy, um, carbon copy of the original. These carbon copies were a fourth or fifth copy and difficult to read. A photograph of this letter and the envelope is attached. A reproduction of the confession letter is also attached. It should be noted that the copies received by the press and our department were on plain white paper of poor quality. Width of the paper is eight inches. The length of the paper is unknown as the suspect, a peculiarity, tore off the bottom and top of the paper. So they wanted us to refer to the photographs. But basically what he did was he, and we saw this in the Gladys Kern case where the letter was actually torn into three sections um, before being delivered. And so now we have this confession letter that's in the middle of an eight and a half by 11, but portions around it have been taken off and likely leaving it at about approximately a, an eight by five or something like that. I'm going to guess the size um, based on the amount of writing that's there. It says it almost might be worthwhile to note that just outside the city limits of Riverside is located March Air Force Base and SAC Base, which is a place where they thought maybe the shoes had been purchased. Physical evidence found at the scene of our crime indicated that heel prints found near the body were made by a heel that was manufactured from military and other government agencies, including prisons. We were unable to lift some latent fingerprints from we were able to lift some latent fingerprints from the victim's vehicle. These prints were not identified. Our unidentified prints are on file with the FBI. Again, so now we have a statement that the FBI has these prints on file, but we have no FOIA file for Sherry Joe Bates. Um 
and copies of the latent lists from your homicide were obtained from CII and sent to the FBI for comparison with the latent lists from our investigation. However, we have no, I, I did not find anyways, that there was anything that came back and said that these prints did not match. Nowhere could I find that. Um, there are numerous similarities in your homicide and our their case. I thought you should be aware that we are working with a similar type homicide investigation. If you are able to determine by handwriting comparison, so again, handwriting comparison is the key thing here, people. Don't let handwriting be the, the reason why you think that this can't be the person or this case can't be closed because handwriting is very, very important, is very identifiable, and it can pinpoint to one person to close a case. Um, but they are asking by any other means. And we also see at the bottom end, uh, or we also see that the handwriting was completed once again by Sherwood Morrill, who did con uh, include that all of the handwriting in the Zodiac and the Riverside area was from, from one person. This is that fallacy we were talking about earlier. Every website you go to wants to produce that Sherry Jo Bates had a uh, yellow Volkswagen. I found this picture uh, at, at one of the websites and I actually, I took it, but I wasn't really sure what to think of it. Was the coloring off? Was it a, a black and white photo they then attempted to color? Like what had happened to this or why did this vehicle appear this lime green color? But as I was doing that research, I was actually able to find a, article from 1966 where it said police still lack clues in the murder, but they say police spotted Miss Bates' lime green Volkswagen on Terracina Avenue. So the fact that they actually printed it in the newspaper and were finding a picture of the vehicle to be lime green, I'm going to say that there is consistent enough evidence to support that this vehicle was lime green, not yellow, as these websites are producing. So um, there was also, this was not known by the public. Oh, okay. So th the uh, disabling of Miss Bates' car had one of the uh, distributor wires pulled. And so the car wouldn't start. She would then need assistance and he could lure her away. So this was not something that was known by the public at the time that the confession letter came out. So I do find that that is one of the clues that the killer would have known because that's how he was able to capture her attention and get him to follow her down that, that alleyway. I see two different things. One is Bates Beetle was parked just 75 yards east of the location where her body was discovered. The ignition wiring of the vehicle had been deliberately pulled loose, but the ignition key was in place and both driver sides and passenger windows were rolled partly down. Um, this makes me believe that there was somebody in the car with her. So possibly the, the suspect who was going to attempt to help her with the car, maybe got in, sat down with her. Um, or maybe he even went with went with her for a ride, which would have killed the battery. One of the things I didn't really quite understand is just the pulling of the distributor uh, plug, how that would have caused the battery to die. You would have then had to, uh, I don't know. It, obviously, the car wouldn't have been able to have started, though um, he was thinking that the battery would die during the time it took for him to get back out to the car based on his letter. Um, the three library books that she had rented or checked out on the subject of United States government were lying on the front seat and several smeared greasy palm prints and fingerprints were found upon the vehicle. Investigators would determine these prints did not belong to Bates or any of her friends or relatives and believe they may have belonged to her murderer. Now, we know that Sonoma County is in possession of a palm print of Jack's and we know that I am in possession of a right thumbprint with two deltas in the in the um, ridges. And the, for a latent fingerprint that he used in his military records. So we do have access to prints that should be able to be cross-referenced with these cases. And it merely takes the opportunity for somebody to do that examination. And they could either clear or they could include Jack at this point. I'm still really kind of blurry on why this evidence isn't being tested or um, examined and investigated because there are simple things they could do if they wanted to rule out that Jack was the Zodiac. I just have this feeling that they already know he is and they don't don't want to, um, it, they don't want to instigate anything into that direction because it will prove itself up. Um, it does say all of the former residents around the scene of the murder are owned by the college and on weekends and late nights, 
Um, and late at night, the unoccupied houses constitute a deserted neighborhood. So basically the alleyway that she was found down, all of those homes were actually owned by the college. And that meant that there would be nobody there to see this um, murder occur. It was a very, very dark alleyway that had no lighting at the time. Um, so very easy to perpetrate this murder. There were indications that people had heard screams, but the hours don't really kind of mesh with what the coroner and the time of death and things had been um, stated by law enforcement at that time, which we'll talk about that too. So um, I did see on Voight's, uh, Tom Voight's site, he said she must have gotten a piece of her assailant. She had ripped off, ripped the time out. Timex watch off his wrist. Her right hand at the base of her right thumb held some hair. Under the nails of that hand, there was skin. Reddish brown, in uh, the three different color hairs that I've I've read, was one was reddish brown, which that fits Jack. Um, dark reddish brown could have been perceived as dark, all the way up to a light blonde, which could have been, if they saw it in the light and the sun coming through it, it would appear light colored. But I've seen three different types of hair that was purportedly in her hand. Um, she had indeed not gone to gone like sheep to the slaughter, he says. The extent of her of the contortions and trauma her face went through during the fight is evident in the little blood spots that erupted from her forehead and scalp. These blood spots called uh, petechiae are created during extreme emotional trauma. Wikipedia also indicated, although uh, only five foot three in in height, Bates had been an athletic woman. Both an examination of the crime scene and Bates' subsequent autopsy revealed ample evidence of a ferocious physical struggle between Bates and her murderer. She having evidently scratched her assailant's arm, face, and head and tore off his rich wristwatch. Now, I find it interesting that everybody keeps claiming that this wristwatch was torn off when in fact they don't have any clue whether or not this was actually even, unless they did some DNA testing and was able to prove that that DNA on that matched the DNA underneath her finger nails. Um, nobody has given us any indication that this watch has literally been um, attributed to the murder, though they do believe that. But we're going to talk about another version of this wristwatch when we get there. So basically, this is the watch that was found at the crime scene. Um, it has been said to be the watch band was seven inches in circumference, that it was a military issue, and some believe that it was tracked back to England. Um, the back and forth from websites had indicated that it stopped at 1220. Two and at 1224. Um, it does kind of look to me that it's more like 1223 versus 1224, but it could be right there in between. Either way, um, I don't believe at the time that the watch stopped, unless that time stopped previous to this murder and this was not the murder suspect's watch. Um, this could have been the time for another murder. And we were going to get to that once we get through Sherry Joe Bra Show Sherry Joe Bates. Um, 10 feet from Bates' body, they said investigators discovered a cheap paint spattered Timex brand wristwatch with a seven inch circumference along with a footprint of a shoe produced by Leavenworth prisoners sold solely in military outlets. Shoe size was between an eight and 10 inches. So um, again, eight to 10. Jack was a 10 and a half, 10, 10 and a half, I believe, based on um, Lake Berryessa size. So I don't know what portion of the shoe that they were missing that would have helped them to determine more solid um, answer to how many inches it actually was. But in the range of 10 is still within the range of Jack. And of course, this one over here to the right, this time X watch is not um, one of evidence. This is just a clear, clean version of this very watch that gave us an idea of what it looked like um, at that time. So the time of murder is also in question. I see people are back and forth there. Um, very rarely do I see that it is printed that she was murdered around the six o'clock hour. Typically speaking, I'm seeing that it is somewhere between 915, 945 um, to 1015, 1045. They also indicated that there was a time change this day and a possibility of individuals not having turned back their clocks when she was killed meant that she was killed an hour earlier than um, what was suspected at that 1015 to 1045 hour. Um, the time of death, however, based on a um, FOIA file is at 6.15 p.m. Sherry Jo Bates was found only a short distance from her car. The time of her death was fixed at about 6.15. He was not aware of the time. Ah, that one part 
Okay, so anyways, basically the uh, FOIA file is stating that 6.15 was the time of death, which would kind of be consistent. We have witnesses that saw her arrive at the, the library at the opening hour. We have um, friends and uh, close friends that were at the library from 6.30 to 9 p.m. The opening hour, hour was 6 p.m. Um, she evidently checked out books and they were found on the seat of her car. She was showed to have checked the books out at 6 p.m. Uh, between the 6 o'clock, 6.15 hour, and then obviously had taken them out to her car and then she was off to her death. Um, the reason why they are claiming that it happened at a much later time is there were there were witnesses who came forward much later stating that there were screams that they heard around that hour and that there was a witness who walked through the alleyway who did not see any body laying there. But if it is pitch dark, because as it's bound to be at six o'clock in November, we know that time change has fallen back. It's dark at about five, starts getting dark around five, five thirty. And by six p.m. it is pitch dark. So with no lights down that alleyway being pitch dark in the time of year that it was, it is very possible with the body off to the right hand side of the alleyway that somebody could have clearly passed on by uh, while Miss Bates was laying there dead and silent. Um, I know that when I go to the library, if I'm checking out books, it's it's very rare that I'm going to stay and study with them. Otherwise, I just stay study and leave them, not check them out and be responsible for them. Typically speaking, if I'm checking them out, it's because I want to take them and go. And it may that may suit it or, or fit the theory that she had arrived early before the, the library had opened. She checked her books out early and she was gone before the 630 hour when her friends and um, other fellow students who and even the staff, nobody recalls seeing her between 6 30 and 9 p.m when the library closed so where was she for this two and a half hours what was she doing um this is actually one of the um the URLs. So I find in these cases, when you come across information that is pertinent and valuable, you should take the URL down. And the reason for that is that as they start to diminish the information that was once published on the internet in regards to this case, the only way to find it on the internet again is with that URL. So I've tracked URLs since the beginning of my um, time with this case because I've watched many computers go down the tubes because of the information that you're researching may likely be connected to viruses. Uh, you get two deep into this thing and you start visiting all kinds of sites. And before you know it, you've got something crashing your computer and your years of research that you've obtained. So keep your URLs. Now we know that the Zodiac wrote the LA Times, um, the BD venue to report um, he was to report it as the Zodiac um, and the Bay Area venue was responsible for Sherry Jo Bates Riverside venue. These are some more cross connections. So we do see here each of law enforcement agencies contacted Express expressed a desire that material be examined by qualified impartial cryptographers. So as early as Sherry Jo Bates, they are talking about wanting to um, do a cryptanalysis on the Sherry Jo Bates letter. This tells me there's a message and a message and that Harry Suchet is absolutely right when she starts telling us that she is finding a message within a message using sim uh, saw or using uh, um, some of the Oh, gosh. Using the way Jack actually stated that he ciphered or encoded messages by using that method, she was able to find messages in a message, including some with the Sherry Jo Bates. So we'll be talking with her at a later time as well. Um, but so here is another reference to examined by qualified impartial cryptograph cryptographers in that there is a possibility that at least a portion of his analysis of the Zodiac codes and symbols may be accurate or of lead value. So each investigator contacted indicated they believed so redacted to be sincere, but his analysis is too complex for the resources of their respective agencies. So we're going to talk about this gentleman and his actual solve as we get um, closer to the end of this, but there is other people out there actively seeking solves in these uh, messages. So the website uh, Zodiac Ciphers actually indicated Sherry Jo Bates was a gregarious, outgoing woman who easily made friends and beneficial traits in her desire to become an air stewardess where personality and social skills are key ingredients. That makes it even more strange that such a vivacious woman, young woman 
who by all accounts was an amiable, humorous, and sociable mood that day, could enter the Riverside College Library shortly after opening time at 6 p.m., check out three books from stocks, and go unnoticed by virtually everybody in the cramped library annex, including her close friends who were present between 6.30 p.m. and 9 p.m. that evening. No testimony of the library attendees that night corroborate the widespread claim she left the library at its 9 p.m. closing time. So again, you have a lot of people saying that she left the library at 9 p.m but all of the evidence is not supporting that. It's more likely that Sherry Jo Bates walked in at 6 p.m., checked out her books, walked out the door, and was killed just like law enforcement reports before her friends showed up at 6.30. This makes the screams at 10.15 or 10.45 not involved in this case, but again, this is pr primarily an empty area um, where there is nobody to... Um, to, to uh, parole or or walk the campuses like security guards or anything like that so this is an area where lots of things can be happening the day we talked about the daylight savings time the newspaper printed that the college who owned the abandoned buildings in that alleyway after the death of sherry joe bates finally installed street lights so here we have um important information that's telling us that there was no lighting available down this alley when the murder occurred. This means that the alleyway was pitch black when the witness who used it walked down it at 9.30 p.m. But there are, were articles of a nearby resident that claimed there were two, me, two men in the alleyway at dark with flashlights looking for something. This, my guess, would be Jack and his brother back at the crime scene, either A, looking for that watch. I don't think they're looking for that watch. I'm going to tell you why here um, when we get in, into that portion of it. But I believe they were looking for the part of the handle to the knife that went missing. And I think that's one of the key pieces of evidence that the killer stated in his confession letter that led the um, law enforcement to believe that that he was the, in fact the killer who authored the letter because he knew that that knife had broken and so did they, but that was information that wasn't released to um, the public. So um, a few more articles that I actually received was more indications that the handwriting had been confirmed. One was a Zodiac link to Riverside co-ed's murder confirmed. Authorities confirmed Monday San Francisco's elusive Zodiac killer definitely wrote uh, notes claiming a Riverside co-ed as his first victim. He has claimed 14 killings in 1968 and 1969, but police have only implicated him in five. So that leaves us with an additional nine murders. And that's just in the Riverside area if we want to locate it or at least um, state that that's where those other nine murders occurred. I, I really highly believe that all nine of those were up here in the Northern California area and the Riverside activity was a completely different activity with no numbers given. Um, although I think he said negative 17 plus at that point in time. So if we had 17 and we take away the five, then we're looking at 12 additional murders somewhere. Um, Cross, one of the detectives, said he received verbal confirmation Monday afternoon from state handwriting experts that the notes sent to the Riverside Press Enterprise were from Zodiac. The three notes read, Bates had to die, there will be more. Um, one of the more interesting points about that is that we see on Tom Voigt's site, he's trying to lead you to believe that there were four handwritten letters because he has four handwritten envelopes and he doesn't indicate what the fourth envelope goes to. That's going to be what I believe is the Patricia Houts letter. So, um, it looks like we're pretty much, oh, we got a couple more minutes here. I'll keep on going. Um, article in 1969 or 1970, the press enterprises ran several stories indicating police know who killed Miss Bates, but don't have enough evidence to try him. So they basically thought that um, a boyfriend or an ex-boyfriend had been at the time. Um, Captain Cross said his investigators for more than two years had felt the killer of Miss Bates was a local youth with a record of frequent troubles with the law. At one time, the pretty freshman had dated the youth on a steady basis, then dropped him for a handsome football star. Now Cross says he isn't so sure about the youth's guilt anymore, which is interesting because they eventually clear him and we'll get to that. Oh, and, and on the websites that you find out about this boyfriend, they've given him an alias of Bob, Bob Barnett. I thought that was just rather ironic since we know that uh, Jack's mother's maiden name is Barnett and we know that he has used Barnett. So is this a um, Freudian slip or is this um, just a huge coincidence? I'm not sure. Either way, he was cleared of DNA in 1998. So one of the other articles that I actually read was that... Um, police 
last night asked persons known to have been in or around the library the night of October 30th to recreate the scene last night. Following the library reenactment, det Detective Sergeant Leroy Green said, police are very interested in talking to a man and woman said to be in the library the night the 18-year-old girl was murdered. The man is described as being heavy set and wearing a beard, Gren said. He was seen talking to a woman in the library annex the night of October 30th. Neither the man nor the woman were among those present last night. So I pulled up this picture. Obviously, this one is in um, 1963 to 65 era, but it is of Jack in front of his battery store. We do see the little paunch in his belly. We do see the barrel chestedness. Jack had uh, a nice big chest there. Um, so it does kind of describe him. And Jack is in and out of beards, as we'll see his pictures as we go through. Um, the police are looking for the man seen in the library that did not show up to the reenactment. Um, the picture of Jack, I, I, I'm not sure exactly when the date was, but I, I believe he can't be ruled out from that. So um, additional Let's, oh, it looks like we're at the end of our time, you guys. We're going to have to come back to this next week. I wish everybody a wonderful 4th of July. Have a great time, and we'll see you next Friday. Take care.